So while it, my slide's getting up, it just, there's, a, there's a sort of top-level comment I suddenly thought it might be worth uh, making, which is um, nature, just to pick on nature specifically, I'm going to be talking about some of the issues about the way we do our jobs and some of the issues we'd like to work with the community to think about. Um, we, nature itself gets about 11,000 papers submitted to it every year, and the average number of authors on those papers is about six, and the percentage that we reject is about 92. So we upset about 50,000 people every year, year after year, not including double counting, of course. But um, I think we disproportionately satisfy people who we publish, and what I mean by that is that I've been in this game one way or another for getting on for 30 years, in fact, and over that time, our approach to publishing papers hasn't changed. Over that time, the, the, the mechanism I'll describe to you hasn't changed. The sort of people we hire haven't changed. But the extent to which a paper in nature can affect people's careers has really changed. So to me, that is a different issue which I'm not going to get into here, but it sort of is a shadow, it seems to me, over the publishing game. And uh, I don't think there's much we can do about it, to be quite honest, because all we do is try and publish the science that we think is most important. Anyway, um, these are the questions I was posed. Do you feel interdisciplinary science and interdisciplinary climate science in particular represents uh, presently have appropriate publication venues? Is the review more challenging for a journal editor for this sort of type of science? And how is the market changing? Big, big questions. So I'm going to give you a, a whistle-stop tour, and you can pick up on any particular thing you want to go into in more depth. I want to pay tribute to Steve Schneider and Climatic Change. It was uh, a really pioneering journal, I thought, and um, has set some standards that we feel as editors are high standards. Um, but um, to talk about the Nature family and then to, to talk about two other journals very briefly, um, we have Nature. We have Nature Geoscience. As of last week, we have Nature Climate Change. We have two more journals I'm going to mention in a minute, but I want to highlight the fact that those three journals do have different missions as far as we're concerned, but they are very much in the hands of the communities who submit to them. The editorial teams on those journals are totally independent. I have only responsibility for the content of Nature, but I have responsibility for appointing, along with the publishers, appointing the chief editors of our other journals. But they, the chief editors, take total responsibility for what gets published in each of their issues. Um, as to what they're trying to do, Nature Geoscience was set up as, as, its, as its name implies, a disciplinary journal. Climate, climate change, we decided, although Nature Geoscience has proved, I think, successful in publishing climate change research, multidisciplinary climate change research. Nevertheless, when it comes to the impacts of climate change, when it comes to some of the social aspects of climate change, um, Nature Geoscience just wasn't picking up on those papers because that wasn't its mission. So although there will be a gray area of mechanistic understanding about why climate change and man-made climate change in particular is happening, which, which Nature Climate Change itself will pick up on, Nature Geoscience is very much there for fundamental studies of the way the Earth system behaves. But um, to mention one aspect of Nature Climate Change that I'm really pleased about, um, we do have a social sciences editor on it. We have a social sciences advisory board. As I'll say later on, we don't have any editorial boards in any of our journals, and we never have. But we do have an advisory board here because social sciences is territory that's completely unfamiliar to us, except in some of the individual contacts we've had. So those, that, that's something I wanted to emphasize about Nature Climate Change. It's highly interdisciplinary, and, but it is, in fact, a topic of a journal rather than a, a discipline of a journal. We also have something called Nature Communications, and this is interesting because it covers all the disciplines. It is pitched at a level that is, um, I would say, we, we intend um, to be something that's less outstandingly innovative, if you want to use that phrase, th than the, the other journals that I've already mentioned, but is very strong in terms of the consolidating sort of science that it'll publish. The other um, interesting aspect of Nature Communications for us is, is, is it's the first Nature branded journal that is open access, hybrid. That is, it has a subscription base, but if authors choose to pay $5,000, they can get immediate free access to their papers. And that was set up that way at the very beginning. And if you try and extend that sort of hybrid model into very high impact journals, you get into extremely high costs per paper if what you're trying to do, uh, that, that is author costs per paper if you're trying to cover the costs of running those journals. That's a separate issue I won't go into unless you want to. But um, it is there. And then also in the, in the, in the 
open access arena um, is a totally different sort of journal where in certain disciplines people are impatient with the whole editors, gatekeepers approach. They want a bit of peer review, very basic peer review, um, but they don't, they don't want to be branded something with a nature brand on it that tells them that it's a wonderful piece of work. They reckon the community can work that out for themselves. My experience of talking to people out there is that actually there are some people who definitely want that sort of easy access approach to the literature, minimal peer review, just get it out there. But there are quite a lot of others who still want a brand of some sort. So how that'll work, go in the long run, who knows. But um, anyway, we have launched very recently, in fact it hasn't yet quite launched, it's launching in June, a journal called Scientific Reports. It is exclusively author pays. Um, the fee is going to be something like $1,300 per paper. Minimal added value, minimal peer review. I'll say more about added value later on because I think that's crucial for publishers to have to think about. But this particular journal is there for anybody, for anything that falls between the cracks of any other journals that are out there. I should mention science. I should mention PNAS. And the reasons I want to mention those two journals is because not only they're there, and do I think they're appropriate for multidisciplinary science, absolutely, but also because we three editors have talked occasionally to discuss policy issues. One of the first things I did when I came into Nature was to work with the then editor of Science, Floyd Bloom, to change our mutual policies on um, data access for structural biology, where there was a particular practice going on that we didn't think was appropriate. And more recently, Bruce Alberts, after he came into science, has instigated meetings between me and him and Randy to talk about things we might do differently in future and how that'll play out isn't yet known. So the editorial approach at Nature, we have no editorial board. Nature itself has 25 editors who are full-time, aged between 30 and 50. They were recruited from postdocs. We select them with particular skills to really be able to take in scientific papers rapidly, to look very critically at what's in them, to keep abreast of the literature. We ensure that they go out to meetings and trips, etc., for quite a bit of the year. Um, but they'll each handle something like 10 papers per week. They are charged with the job of making an instant editorial judgment. Is this the sort of thing that this journal should be publishing? Is it important enough? I want to stress that we never judge papers in terms of their public appeal or their media interest or whatever, what we're really trying to look at is for scientific impact, and scientific impact incidentally. Sometimes we'll let in a paper that may be less innovative but has a policy impact. Sometimes we'll let in a paper that isn't mechanistically insightful but is some sort of a resource for the community that will have a big impact in that sense. So that's another sort of scientific importance. So we'll reject something like 65% immediately if we ourselves don't think they add up to that. We try to do that in about a week and then we'll referee the rest and we'll accept about 8% of the total. But what the fun thing about the refereeing process is that it is our job to make the judgment. It isn't an editorial board member's job to make the judgment. So we'll use referees with diverse technical expertise, diverse conceptual backgrounds. They're judging papers on their own terms. So if they come up with technical criticisms, of course we take those and respond to them and reject a paper if we have to or invite revision. But we also get referees who will give them us quite valuably their opinion as to the significance of the paper. And sometimes they will include comments, which is, I don't think this is significant enough for nature. And it's our job, however, to make that judgment. And there have been occasions when all three referees have said, fine paper, but not significant enough for nature. And we've decided, nevertheless, to go ahead and publish it. Um, I can't remember such a case in climate change, I have to say, but I can certainly remember that in cases like um, cancer research and some of the papers that we have then published have proved, out to be, have proved to be very significant. So although there is no doubt about the fact that this editorial assessment is a subjective process, I think we have a reasonable track record in judgments, but boy, I'm sure we've let some good ones go. Sorry about that. So one of the questions I was asked is, is the review more challenging for interdisciplinary papers? And my answer to that is not much. This is partly because it's our job, it always has been nature's job, and indeed the other journal's job, within their frames of reference, to be multidisciplinary in their thinking, and to just sit next to each other, or very easily contactable. We get together as teams, we know each other, we can talk, we can seek advice across the disciplinary boundaries, and we have a long, a big referees database. We know, we know pretty much where to go. We're always trying to update our referees when we go to meetings and so on. Are the merits of such manuscripts more difficult to recognize? Not necessarily given the sort of experience that editors have and the sort of things they're looking for, but there may be absolutely, of course, by definition, a need for more consultation. We may need to go to, rather than the typical two or three referees, we may need to go to four or five or six. We will go to whatever it takes to make a technical assessment. 
And sometimes you need an over, overarching in, insight as to why this paper might be important, a holistic view on a multidisciplinary paper. And yes, editors are trained and expected to do that, but of course we look to individuals out there in the community who have a larger than usual holistic outlook to try and give us advice when we can. And what steps are you taking to address these sort of challenges? We, well, it's always been our job, but we do recruit new editors if we're trying to get into new disciplines. Nature, cl nature climate change, getting into the social sciences. I don't know whether in the long run some of our other journals, including Nature, might get more explicitly into certain of the social sciences. Um, in the past, we've been low nature on chemistry, specific aspects of, of specialised chemistry, and uh, we've recruited chemists recently to build that up. So we, we will adapt in that respect. Um, here's a case of a, a specific article that I commissioned um, with, uh, the, well, I mean, I didn't commission it, Mike White, uh, who's one of our main climate editors, commissioned. This was specifically intended to throw light on a rather political issue, which is, you know, China was taking a particular posture in Copenhagen and so on, and I thought actually it would be good to have a look at what one could say. And it highlights, you know, all the interdisciplinary issues, because there are a lot of interdisciplinary aspects here. Also highlights a rather interesting case when you're assessing papers from China and you're looking at some of the regional impacts, the literature in many cases is Chinese, so how do we handle that? And you know, we got into questions of how much are we prepared to pay to get translations of the relevant literature cited in the, in the, in the document where it's absolutely crucial. And uh, we decided we would if necessary. In the end, actually, for this paper it wasn't necessary, but that's part of what you have to do. I won't go through these. These are just some multidisciplinary papers that we published in Climate Change where we've identified the, the, the specific multidisciplines involved. Um, none of that will surprise you, I don't think. Um, I just wanted to give you a trace, of, a, a taste of the discussion that will go on. If you looked in our archive, this is what you'd see. So I've, gi I've given names to protect the innocent and the guilty of our multidisciplinary referees, Galileo, Newton, and Darwin. And um, this is one of our editors just looking at the particular late early stage discussion of the first round on review of this paper, looking at what the strengths of the paper are in the eyes of this referee, that referee, etc., trying to judge up what, how best to go forward, what sort of options to offer the, ref the author. But um, the end is your thoughts on the matter are most welcome, and the point is these papers get discussed around the team. So other editors will then have chipped in, and it would have in, it, it, this one ended up getting published. Open peer review was mentioned, uh, I think, by Ron as um, something that should be thought about. We did a whole trial of open peer review, which lasted about four months. Um, and in our, I won't say any detail about it. it. It was a success in the sense that it showed that open peer review had no interest to speak of amongst the community at that time in, in the most general sense in which we ran it. So if you do want to find out more about that, by all means, go and have a look at that. This is not to say that we would never do it in future. The other thing to say is that some journals have been set up with comments on papers, a comment facility, Public Library of Science 1, which was PLOS 1, which is a pioneering journal in this respect, um, specifically set itself the mission of opening up post-publication peer review. And it's been very disappointing in the results that the people, for all sorts of motivational reasons I think you can understand, you really want to spend your time commenting publicly on the literature. Why wouldn't you? Lots of reasons why you wouldn't, and so people don't. Um, there is no question that if a journal like Nature or PNAS asks you to comment on a paper, you feel much more motivated to do so. To me, the critical issue there is how to get more credit for people who do the peer review job for us journals, and that is something we are actually working on. And then fostering multidisciplinary discussions is also something that we should be doing. Um, this is a paper that we published that in the end we decided not to peer review. It came in with a host of distinguished authors. Um, we published it under this banner feature. How many people noticed the fact that this wasn't an article? How many people noticed the disclaimer at the end that said this was not peer reviewed? I don't know. But the point was, it's, this, is, this is all to do with planetary boundaries and tipping points and how can we dis define them in the future. So I think it was a genuine attempt to get a discussion going. We had an online aspect of it that allowed people to discuss and we also commissioned at the time of publication um, a, a series of news and views articles from different disciplinary viewpoints. So that, and, and some of which were skeptical, incidentally, and which actually, therefore, I hope, helped some sort of a discussion out in the community. What we didn't, in this case, organize an online forum, but that is something, of course, one can do in principle. Another discussion point for me is something I raised at yes in one of yesterday's question sessions, this whole question of data and model access. So we published a paper which is one of our most published, not, not a paper, sorry, a comment, one of our most commented um, worldview things. You can find it. It's free, free access. Um, if you just Google for that, you'll find it. 
um, a whole discussion about how easy is it in certain disciplines to publish your computer code so that everyone can see it and, and do it. I see the chairs getting up, so I'll take the hint. And I will simply say that as far as the market ad adapting and changing is concerned, we've talked about the business models changing, but there is this idea in the far future, and I don't know how visionary or soon this is, this is going to happen. It's always difficult to tell if you think what we had available on the internet 10 years ago, there's a massive change has taken place in the last 10 years. So 10 years from now, I think we're going to be something more like this. So instead of, instead of the, um, the, pe the, the conventional scientific paper, I've now done exactly the wrong thing by um, doing something wrong, and I'm not going to try to change it, I'll just speak. Um, but um, the, instead of just having a scientific paper, you have this ho host of information <coughs> out there, and it's an integrated, potentially, an integrated host of information in the form of computer software, the non-journal literature, databases, individual peer-reviewed articles, each of which just reps a snapshot of a stage of development of that literature. And the question is, as this slide is showing, can you get to a point where that is interrogatable using things like semantic technologies? Can you just get into this entire integrated literature and make, make just get what you need out of it in a much more open way? And it's part of publishers' jobs to, to look at that developing you know, what, I, what you can think of as a plasmosphere of sort of glowing stuff and work out where do we add value. So selecting papers, we add value, we hope. Adding things into papers to make them more navigable, we add value. Hosting, adding comments, adding media attention, all of that stuff is where we can add value. And so our job for the future is to look at how we do that as this morass of scientific information, which is a bit of a pejorative term, this, this wonderful glowing plasma ball of scientific information <laughs> develops. Thank you very much.